A new administration begins in America. Joe Biden becomes president Wednesday. The National Mall will stand empty except for 25,000 troops. Roaring back, growth in China hits pre-pandemic levels. Can it sustain them? And the UK shuts its borders this week to anyone who hasn't tested negative. The country will step up its mass vaccination program. Well, good morning, everyone, and happy Monday. This is Bloomberg Surveillance. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London. Now, let's quickly check on the markets. Of course, a reminder, it is Martin Luther King Day in the U.S., so if you look at Treasuries, they're actually closed today. The focus, of course, will be on the inauguration. We have a team coverage throughout the day and then our special coverage on Wednesday to understand exactly what policies uh, Joe Biden will push through and how quickly he can do so. If you look at uh, U.S. Uh, futures, they're dipping. European equities also dipping. There's investor caution at the start of the week, even as data indicates that China's economic recovery remains pretty much on track. A couple of other things I want to show you is the dollar nudging up and then crude oil sleeping. Now let's get straight to the Bloomberg. First word news here in London with me is Leanne Gerrans. Hi, Leanne. Hi, Francine. China's economy expanded last year. The only major nation to avoid a contraction in the fourth quarter recovered to growth rates not seen since the start of the pandemic, pushing the full year expansion to 2.3%. Nomura is now predicting China could top the U.S. as the world's largest economy by 2028. Germany's CDU has elected the continuity candidate as its next leader. Armin Laschet closely resembles outgoing Chancellor Angela Merkel in both policy and style. His leadership of the country's ruling party doesn't guarantee he'll be nominated to be the next chancellor, but it puts him in pole position for the job and gives him a key role in shaping the policies of the next government. Putin critic Alexei Navalny has been arrested on his return to Moscow following treatment in Germany for poisoning. He was met by officers at passport control as he landed on Sunday. According to the state-run TASS news agency, he was detained for violating the terms of a suspended sentence. Navalny took the flight, knowing he could face a lengthy prison sentence. Global News, 24 hours a day, on air and at Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Leanne Gerrans. This is Bloomberg Francine. Leanne, thank you so much. Now let's get straight to our top story. Joe Biden will become president this Wednesday. Thousands of National Guard's troops have been deployed to Washington, D.C. ahead of the inauguration. The city, of course, on high alert, with authorities receiving multiple reports of violent threats at the level of the incident that happened at the U.S. Capitol this month. Well, joining us now to discuss all of this is Bloomberg senior editor uh, Derek Wellbank. Derek, great to have you on such an important week. What do we actually know about these violent threats? Well, Francine, what we know is that officials in Washington uh, leading up to the <clears throat> incident at the Capitol, uh, they've been criticized for not taking threats seriously enough. This is a 180-degree uh, change from that. You are seeing a security posture in the nation's capital that I have never seen before, candidly, and I lived in the area for many, many years. Um, you are seeing downtown Washington, D.C., which is always under heightened security around the inauguration, but you usually expect crowds of a couple hundred thousand to come there and hear what the new president has to say on the National Mall. Well, it's going to be very quiet this year. It was going to be quiet before COVID, but now you've got barricades up uh, creating what is effectively a green zone uh, in downtown Washington, D.C., around the National Mall, the White House, and the Capitol. Uh, very, very unusual kind of setup there. But again, the Capitol just got stormed, what, two weeks ago, so you can sort of see where it's coming. Into all of that steps Joe Biden. He is a longtime veteran uh, politician. As you know, he's been around, he's been in the, in the Senate for decades and then vice president. He's going to take office and he's going to try and talk about unity in this moment. He's going to try and talk about coming together and he is going to be speaking to a country that is, quite candidly, as divided as it's been uh, in many years. Derek, what is Joe Biden actually expected to say in his inauguration speech? Well, I think, I think as I say, I think he'll, he'll go hard on unity. Uh, this is somebody who uh, wants to project that an era of competence is returning, that an era of you know, maybe you're not going to get whiplash wondering what went on Twitter is coming back. And so I think he's going to talk to some of those. He's going to try and thread together uh, views of, of an America where 
anything is possible if we're united. He's going to talk a lot about the big challenges that are facing the United States. And one of those, obviously, is the COVID-19 pandemic. But you've got some other ones. He's, he may talk about climate. He may talk about race, race relations um, and, and racial equality. He'll probably almost certainly talk about the economy. Those are all issues that we expect Biden to to go at very early, very hard. You know, remember, he's already put forward plans for a $1.9 trillion stimulus package. The other thing that I expect, Francine, is that there will be words, but there will also be actions. A lot of times in American politics, you hear of, I'm going to do this on day one. And that kind of is a vague term that doesn't actually mean day one. It might mean the first couple weeks. This means day one. You get ready for executive orders to drop on day one, reversing some Trump administration policies, uh, because Biden has put together a team of people who are veterans. They know how the mechanics of government work, and they are getting ready to launch a blitz of stuff on actually day one. Um, do you have any insight, Derek, into what you know Donald Trump is planning to do in his last few days as president? Well, the president, according to his public schedule, is having many meetings and many calls, but no details on any of those as yet. Uh, What we do know in terms of his last day, though, our Jennifer Jacobs reported uh, that he was going to have a farewell event and then book it out of town, uh, destination Florida. Now, what's interesting about this is that there's been a longstanding tradition of presidents stretching back decades attending the inauguration of the next person elected after them. And Trump is currently scheduled to miss all of that. Um, so so it's going to be a very unusual handing over of power uh, in that usually there's this, there's this big sort of Washingtonian kind of um, peaceful transition and making a big example of all of that for the world. This has been a very unusual transfer of power uh, as you know, and uh, so this is just going to be one more one more break from the norm. Thank you so much, our Bloomberg senior editor there, following, of course, the White House very closely, Derek Wellbank. Now, joining us this morning is Paul Donovan. He's global chief economist at UBS Wealth Management. Uh, Paul, we have to talk about the U.S. We probably should talk about inauguration, but many more things that we also need to talk about. I know, Paul, you look also extensively not only at the economy from a pure GDP point of view, but actually you've just written a brilliant book on prejudice. What are we seeing in the U.S. right now in terms of income equality and actually trajectory for a better path ahead. So this, I think, is one of the challenges that the incoming administration is going to be facing up to. So as we move beyond the pandemic, what we're going to be finding is structural change in the economy is being accelerated. And so the risk here is that some groups in society are going to continue to feel left behind. And that, of course, was a a worry that uh, U.S. President Trump uh, uh, tapped into in his campaigns uh, quite brilliantly. So you get that loss of status coming through because some people's jobs are going to disappear. About 10 to 15 percent of jobs will disappear in the next 20 years. But also a lot of people's jobs are going to change. And some will change the better, but some will be changing for the worse. So this inequality gap is going to be a problem. And remember, it's not just about inequality of income. It's also about social status. Um, And tackling both of those issues is going to be very difficult. What does that mean for what kind of recovery Paul will get? So I think you're ending up with a rather uneven recovery. Um, And this is being reflected already in the recovery that we have been seeing from the initial phases of lockdown. So you have parts of the economy that really bounce back immediately. I mean, look at things like furniture retail or or furniture production in the United States. I mean, these are way above pre-pandemic levels because these are areas of the economy that were able to bounce back. But then you've got whole sectors in, in the service industry that are really, you know, not going anywhere and where there are are going to be very, very big problems in, in emerging in the future. So what you're ending up with then is this, this division. And it means, I think, that you know, we, we have a problem with language. It, all too often I hear it was recession, double dip recession. This isn't a recession in the traditional sense, because for parts of the economy, things are back to normal. 
And for parts of the economy, things are never going to recover. And so this is not a normal recession. And I think using that sort of terminology um, misleads us about the nature of the recovery, misleads us about the sort of policies that are going to be required. Uh, I think we need to come up with new language to describe what's going on at the moment. So what kind of language would you come up with, Paul? Is it, you know, if we suspended the economy, given what we know about the stimulus plan from Joe Biden, is it actually enough to, to put the economy on a better footing until the vaccines, you know, arrive in troves and we can get a, a bit back to normal? So a lot of what we are seeing is antidepressant rather than stimulus. You're trying to prevent things from, from getting worse. Uh, and I think certainly, for example, extending the moratorium on evictions. That's a, a very good example of something which stops things getting worse. You're containing the situation until we can talk about you know, lifting the fear of the virus and getting back to a more normal economic outlook. Uh, the $2,000 uh, check or uh, an additional $1,400, um, that is more stimulus. That's a more direct form of stimulus. Um, personally, I'm not sure it's, it's the best focused, but it's probably the simplest politically to get through. Uh, and that does, of course, help people who are suffering from uh, a lack of employment, who are you know, uh, facing up to financial challenges through no fault of their own. Uh, and so it is, a, it is a benefit. It's just not particularly targeted. Um, so we are seeing measures here which I think tied us over. But nothing that we're seeing so far is dealing with the bigger structural issues that are being accelerated by the pandemic. So we're getting through to, you know, hopefully the post-pandemic phase, but we're still going to have these structural imbalances in the economy that need to be resolved. And these policies, they're not designed to deal with those structural imbalances. It requires further measures later on uh, to tackle uh, the challenges of the fourth industrial revolution. Paul, thank you so much. Uh, Paul Donovan there from UBS Wealth Management stays with us and we'll have plenty more from Paul. Of course, throughout the program, we talk about Asia, we talk about China, and then we also talk about the European Union. Now, you can also uh, don't miss our coverage, our special coverage of President-elect Joe Biden's inauguration. That's on Wednesday from 4 p.m. London time. I know I'll be tuning in. It's going to be uh, fronted by our David Weston and Kevin Cirilli. This is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics, this is Bloomberg Surveillance. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London. Now, the data out of China today comes in the form of a familiar number, 6.5%. GDP picks up where it left off before the pandemic, making China the only major nation that grew in 2020. Here's what our guests on Bloomberg have been saying about the figure. The overall uh, the quarter uh, really uh, seems to have uh, shown that uh, economy has ended the year on a strong note. Uh, the manufacturing is doing well. In terms of Chinese data, very much in line with expectations, very positive for the country and the region. The thing we're watching out for is uh, whether the PBOC is actually going to continue maintaining a very tight policy uh, in the face of an, of an economy which is uh, potentially on the brink of deflation. Well, still with us is Paul Donovan from UBS Wealth Management. Uh, Paul, how much does this, I guess, you know, economic um, growth in China help the rest of the world? Uh, basically not at all. Um, so the data, in my view, is actually a little bit troubling. Um, if you look at the domestic demand, the, the, the retail sales as a proxy for, for domestic consumption, that actually is still underperforming. So I think what the Chinese data is telling us is two things. It's telling us that China has you know, pulled the levers on the traditional but perhaps not very productive areas of the economy. So you get a, a huge boost in, in real estate investment, for example. You get a boost in infrastructure investment. These are areas which are under government control or, or quite a lot of government control, but not necessarily very productivity enhancing. And then you get exports. Now, that's telling us that the European consumer and the US consumer is doing a lot better. Um, but of course, the consumer is not able to go out and spend on services, so they're spending on goods. Uh, 
uh, and China as the world's largest manufacturer, of course, benefits from that in terms of exports. So that's great. The problem with that is it's probably not going to last throughout this year, because once the vaccine is rolled out, once the fear of the virus has dissipated, people are going to go and want to have fun. Now, Buying a new washing machine is not a lot of fun. Fun is going out and meeting your friends finally and you know, having dinner or drinks with friends. And so that shift in spending in the second half of this year works for China's disadvantage. And we really need to see China changing the composition of its GDP if it's going to be able to sustain decent growth this year. Paul, if you look at some of the things that actually, you know, China could could become in the future, when does it actually start buying goods of other countries? Will that be a changing point and will it come in the next decade? I think that this is actually quite a tricky issue because, of course, we're starting to move through this accelerated process of structural change, which means I think that we see more localization of production. Now, that's a negative for China because you know, the, the model of being part of global supply chains is going to start to fade. But it's also potentially a positive that some of the things that China would be importing from the rest of the world, it's more likely to be making locally, I think, in the future. We've already seen this to a certain extent with the auto sector, for example, where, of course, you know, China imports the intellectual property of the design, but essentially most of the manufacture is taking place domestically. That, I think, is a pattern that we'll see being repeated across other industries. So I'm not saying that, you know, that China disengages from the global economy. All economies, I think, will be going through this. This is why, over a period of some years, global trade is likely to continue to decline as a share of global GDP, as we see this localization story. Um, but it changes the role of China in the global economy in that sense. Um, Paul, I know you, you have some, some, you know, I always enjoy your threads, especially on Twitter, but also your research notes when talking about inflation. What are we going to see this year? Is it reflation or could we actually start seeing a bit of inflation? So I think you get slightly higher inflation, but you're not going to get high inflation. Now, we all know there is going to be a base effect uh, late first quarter, early second quarter, because, of course, back in 2020, the oil prices, as, as you remember, went negative. Um, so you're going to be doing a year-on-year -year comparison to a very low oil price. And oil is between 3 and 5 percent of headline and core inflation. Core is, uh, has oil embedded in it uh, in most major economies. So the fact that you've got you know, uh, an increase in the oil price relative to last year, that gives us a base effect. That's temporary. Policymakers aren't going to worry about it. Economists aren't going to worry about it. The markets will probably react because you know, markets don't listen to economists as often as they should. But you won't get a big reaction on the back of this. Thereafter, uh, inflation, I think, ticks up a little bit because we are currently probably underreporting inflation in most major economies uh, because the composition of spending patterns has shifted. Inflation hasn't caught up with that yet, so there'll be a, a little bit of a push there. But ultimately, you've still got enormous amounts of spare capacity. We're not looking at economies reducing their output gaps to zero this year. We're still going to have GDP below the 2019 level in most major economies. So that spare capacity is likely to continue to weigh on inflation, and it allows us to be a little bit higher, but not high in terms of inflation. Paul, thank you so much. Paul Donovan there from UBS Wealth Management stays with us. We'll have plenty more, of course, from Paul later this hour, and we'll also focus on the European Union. Now, also coming up later, Merkel's CDU picks Armin Laschet as its new leader. We discuss what is in store for Germany's ruling party ahead of the national elections. That's coming up shortly, and this is Bloomberg.
economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London. Now let's get straight to the Bloomberg Business Flash. Here's Leanne Gerrans. Hi, Leanne. Hi, Francine. Kushtad and Kafour have abandoned talks on a proposed $20 billion merger after opposition from the French government. The two will instead look at forming a looser alliance, working together on fuel purchases, branding and distribution. The deal would have been one of the biggest ever takeovers of a French firm by a foreign company. Job openings in London's finance industry almost halved in 2020. City firms advertised just over 16,000 new roles last year, a drop of 49% from the year before. According to data from recruitment firm Morgan McKinley, that's the lowest since at least 2015. The slump comes amid a double whammy of the pandemic and a Brexit. And that's your Bloomberg Business Flash, Francine. Leanne, thank you so much. Now, coming up, we speak to Paolo Gentiloni. He is the European Commissioner for Economy and Financial Affairs. And we have a couple of things to talk about, which is uh, possible deflation. We'll talk about vaccine rollout, what that means, of course, for the economy. We also have to talk about Italy, uh, stimulus, the recovery. There's quite a lot of uh, conversational topics we'll do with Mr. Gentiloni. This is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance. I'm Francine Lacma here in London. Now let's get straight to your Bloomberg First Word News. Here's Leanne Garrett. Hi, Leanne. In Francine, Goldman Sachs is raising its outlook for the U.S. economy. Due to President-elect Joe Biden's $1.9 trillion revival plan, the bank's economists now expect growth of 6.6% in 2021. That's two-tenths faster than previously thought. Goldman's estimate is the second highest in Bloomberg's survey. The median is just a 4.1%. Now, Biden's pick for Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen is expected to make it clear the U.S. isn't after a weaker dollar to give it a competitive advantage. The Wall Street Journal is reporting she'll make the remarks at a confirmation hearing tomorrow. It cites officials in Biden's transition team who say she'll affirm that the dollar's value should be determined by the market. And the UK is stepping up its coronavirus vaccination programme. It plans to offer the shots to millions more people as the country shuts its borders to anyone who hasn't tested negative. The vaccine rollout will be extended to the third and fourth highest priority groups, those aged over 70 and those deemed extremely vulnerable. Global News 24 hours a day on air and at Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts and more than 120 countries. I'm Leanne Gerens. This is Bloomberg. Francine. Thank you so much, Leanne. Now, Europe's finance ministers gather by video conference today for the first meeting of 2021. Top of the agenda, of course, will be a discussion about imbalances in the wake of the COVID crisis and how to deal with those imbalances. Ministers will also debate priorities for the EU flagship recovery and resilience plan, and they will look ahead to a new man in the White House and how relations with the United States will change in the coming months. Well, I'm very pleased to be joined from Brussels by EU Commissioner for the Economy, he's Paolo Gentiloni, and also Bloomberg's Maria Tadea joins us for the interview as well. Commissioner Gentiloni, thank you uh, for joining us on this Monday morning, bright and early, uh, before we have a, a very interesting discussion this afternoon. What do you think is the number one concern for Europe at the moment, Commissioner? When you look at the lockdowns, because we're slower than other parts of the world to roll out vaccines, does it mean that it's almost a given that we have a double dip recession in the EU? Um, well, of course, this is uh, our main... Uh, good morning, first of all. Um, this is our main concern, uh, to, to try to uh, avoid that the fact that we have a second wave in the pandemic uh, brings uh, a, a, a second recession. Um, of course, this uh, is connected to the pandemic, uh, not to our... Um, uh, political uh, uh, decisions, because we decided not to withdraw uh, prematurely uh, supporting measures. Uh, we decided to keep these supporting measures um, in 2021. Uh, so we are we are trying to avoid this uh, with our 
uh, political decisions. But of course, lockdowns, as everybody knows in Europe, are, are still there. Um, and uh, this is our challenge and what we will discuss uh, this afternoon. And we will discuss also about a relation with the U.S. Uh, having a conversation with uh, former uh, Secretary uh, Larry Summers. And uh, Commissioner, just as Francine said, uh, the economy is not back to normal. We're seeing big restrictions. There is delays with the Pfizer vaccine too. I know you said that in the spring there was going to be a conversation as to whether or not ex to extend the fiscal rules which have been suspended. Do you believe that at this point this is not going to go back to normal until 2022, that those rules are going to stay suspended for longer? Uh, well, we are not seeing uh, until now uh, a scenario, um, so to say, a normal scenario. Uh, we are still um, with with uh, a, a uncertainty dominating uh, the, the European environment, and not only the European one. Uh, so decisions uh, about uh, what we call the general escape clause uh, which is the form we suspend our procedures on fiscal rules, uh, a decisions will come next spring. Um, and it will come uh, according to the evolution of the situation. Of course, um, the fact is that uh, several uh, European countries will not probably uh, be back in 2022 at the uh, level of growth they uh, expected, but even at the level of growth that they already had at the end of 2019. If this will be the case, uh, there will be also a case for uh, further uh, extraordinary uh, measures. But this is the discussion that we will have in spring, hoping to have less uncertainty at this time. And when you say extraordinary measures, does it mean more easing? I mean, if you compare the situation with the U.S., we are seeing that Joe Biden is coming with a huge stimulus plan. Is there a risk that the European plan is becoming or coming short of expectations? I don't think so. Of course, we, are, um, we have an enormous amount of optimism connected to the new U.S. administration, and not only for the uh, economic stimulus package, but for many other reasons. Uh, as far as Europe is concerned, of course, we have always to remember that we are not a federal state. Um, we are the union, and uh, national uh, authorities reacted and are still reacting with enormous firepower to this crisis more than 4% of GDP in mem European member states was spent to face the crisis. Um, to this, we add, for the first time, the European Union issuing a common debt for a common purpose. This is very mm -hmm. important, I would say qualitatively, because it will allow our economies to uh, came out of the crisis greener, more resilient, and more competitive, yeah. but we have to count both interventions, the national one and the European one. But, Commissioner, is your base case now a double dip recession, and is it something that we could see in the first or second quarter? Uh, I think we have to, to fight to avoid it. Um, we, we have a very different situation, I would say. Um, uh, manufacturing is performing uh, rather well um, and has been performing rather well even in the worst period last, last year. But of course, services and especially services with contact person to person are still in deep difficulty. Um, we, we will have our winter forecast in uh, 20 days from now. Yeah. And I think we will there have a clearer picture uh, about the risk of a double dip recession. Uh, Commissioner, when are you exactly expecting the funds from the recovery uh, fund to flow? Um, uh, in principle, um, at the end of uh, springtime, 
um, uh, beginning of summer, so I mean in, in, in June in principle, um, we are working with National Recovery and Resilience Plan and uh, we will, uh, as European Commission, uh, go to financial market uh, in spring to raise these 750 billion. Uh, I have to say we had a very good experience um, November and December with this SURE mechanism. We issued uh, social bonds for dozens of billions of euros uh, with a very, very huge oversubscription. So we are quite optimistic on the result of this uh, European issuance of common debt. And Commissioner, you're, you're Italian. I'm, I, I know you don't want to get into the politics, but this has an impact on the European economy. Italy is a country that's going to get the most money from the recovery fund. But politically, the situation looks very tricky. Uh, I have two questions on that, in fact. Uh, in the spring, Italy should have a 10 percent payment from the recovery fund. If there's a caretaker government, can they access that money? And then secondly, do you worry that all of this political anxiety actually means that the money is not going to be used well? Well, of course, the, um, uh, the money will uh, come to each member states, uh, even in a higher percentage, because in the discussion with the European Parliament, we um, uh, brought the percentage of the pre-financing from 10 to 14 percent. Um, but this will be for each member states. Um, it's not a problem of the uh, quality of their governments. Uh, as far as, uh, as the Italian situation is concerned, as you were saying, it's uh, difficult for us to uh, comment uh, internal politics, and it is difficult to avoid to do this for me as former prime minister. But in any case, I, I would say that uh, we, we hope to have uh, stable interlocutors, because exactly for the reason you were mentioning, Italy will be crucial for the success of this uh, European next generation plan, uh, and we need stable interlocutors. But how difficult or how worried are you that Italy could actually, you know, sink Europe if there's not more stability soon? Uh, well, I, I'm, uh, we are working with um, Italy and with other uh, 14 governments that already presented their draft plans for the uh, European funding. Um, some of these governments are stronger, others are more fragile. Um, we have minority governments all around Europe. So I think it's important uh, to have stable interlocutors and also to have interlocutors working for the European common cause. And I hope that this will be the case also for Italy. Um, Commissioner, there are more and more reports about not enough chip makers used by automakers, and a number of automakers around the world, but also in Europe, have had to stop some of their production. How much of a worry is this for the Commission? Well, it is a, a more than a worry. It is a challenge uh, because we um, uh, consider uh, within uh, our uh, plans. And of course, uh, within the uh, common European added value of these plans, uh, the, the possibility to uh, strengthen this capacity. And uh, I think we will uh, be able to do this, uh, and this will reassure our industry. Thank you so much, you Commissioner there for the Economy, Paolo Gentiloni, and of course our Maria Tadeo, both of us from Brussels. Now coming up, a new leader for Germany's CDU. What will the choice of Armin Laschet mean for the country and for the rest of the region? We'll discuss that shortly, and this is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics, this is Bloomberg Surveillance. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London. Now, let's discuss the latest from Europe's biggest economy. 
Germany's CDU has picked Armin Laschet as its new leader. The 59-year-old state leader from the industrial heartlands is a backer of the moderate econ economic and foreign policy course set by Angela Merkel. Now, he also has a good relationship with the French president, Emmanuel Macron, and shares her vision of a more integrated EU. Well, still with us to talk about uh, the EU, not only Italy, but also Germany, is uh, Paul Donovan from UBS Wealth Management. And Paul, we were just speaking there with Commissioner Gentiloni about some of the main concerns that he had. Um, what will be the challenge for Germany in the next six to seven months? Does a centrist head of CDU mean that they'll have to find some kind of coalition with maybe a Green or even someone far right to gain enough votes in September? I think the the immediate uh, issue, of course, is how does Germany deal with the transition? Again, as a, as a manufacturing economy, Germany has, has been benefiting from the fact that people are buying stuff, people are buying goods at the moment. So as we transition uh, to, to more service sector focused growth later this year, how does Germany deal with that? It loses some of its relative advantage. Um, the economic circumstances are still going to be challenging as we go into the elections later this year. Uh, and I think that that's going to uh, require perhaps a, a fairly broad coalition of political views um, to, to try and establish a, a stable government after, the, after elections. So, yes, I, I think there, there's going to be a series of challenges that lie ahead um, for the CDU, for any party in Germany, uh, as it tries to deal with um, uh, coming out of the pandemic, but also the transition uh, to uh, increase service sector emphasis in the economy in the second half of the year. Uh, Paul, overall, is there a danger that, you know, the, the mayhem of politics that we're seeing in the U.S. actually gets brought over, gets imported in, in some European countries? The polarization of politics... Um, it's it's almost inevitable in a in a period of structural change. I mean, this is the, the subject of my book that that you end up with the rise of prejudice caused by the economic dislocation of of uh, structural change, the industrial revolution. The point about industrial revolutions, of course, is they are revolutionary. They change society. They change politics, and that's going to be one of the challenges any economy is seeing now. Different economies focus on different groups in, in terms of scapegoat economics and in terms of, of problems with prejudice. And different countries will have different mechanisms to be able to cope and to be able to deal with that. But I think we have to accept that prejudice politics is going to be something uh, present in European society as in US society for some time to come. That doesn't mean that we shouldn't be fighting against it. Of course, we should be fighting against it you know, with, with every available weapon. But prejudice politics is going to be a feature. That does mean political polarization. It does mean uh, problems, because generally speaking, financial markets are not very good at dealing with populism, at pricing in populism. It creates volatility and uncertainty. But, but what are so what is what kind of economic recovery or disbursements do we need now in Europe to be able to avoid that? Europe's got some advantages relative to the United States. So uh, obviously Europe has its welfare state in place. I and mean, the, the US has, has sort of frantically scrambled to patch together a welfare support network along European lines um, in the early stages of the pandemic. I mean, a lot of the additional unemployment benefit and so forth is, is essentially trying to get um, European automatic stabilizers in place. So Europe has already got you know, the, the safety net, which deals with the income side. What it's not doing perhaps so well is creating the flexibility in the labor force that allows people to retrain more easily, you know, to get the right sort of higher education, which pushes people in the right direction so that you get labor forces that are able to deal with a rapidly changing world. And this comes back to, I think, what is a, a critical point. It's not just about income inequality. It's not just income inequality that's the problem. It's social inequality. If you see your social status changing, and we find that actually a lot of the prejudice politics, a lot of the polarization comes not from income inequality. That tends to be a more social democrat type political direction. The political extremism comes from social inequality. And that's going to be something which requires longer term planning uh, on the part of the European Union, but in particular, the national governments. Yeah. 
Paul. Thanks so much. Paul Donovan there from UBS Wealth Management. Now, coming up, U.S. bank earnings season gets underway. The CFO of Wells Fargo tells us he expects the wealth management business to be a key driver of growth. Our interview is next. This is Bloomberg. to Wall Street results in JP Morgan City and Wells Fargo have cut their combined reserves for loan losses by more than $5 billion. That's helped their fourth quarter profit top estimates while well, we spoke to the Wells Fargo chief financial officer. We are moving with uh, urgency um, and I think we, we set the bar for ourselves probably higher than others, uh, than investors or other constituents. We really want to make sure that we can move uh, the agenda forward uh, but we need to do it in the right way. We need to do it in a, in a way that is uh, is controlled and in, in a way that sort of helps us achieve our objectives in servicing our clients and, and really being there to support our clients, which, you know, starts with having a strong balance sheet. You saw that in the quarter. You know, capital liquidity levels are really strong. Um, you know, we've seen good performance in our underlying credit portfolios. So having that foundation to work from, I think, is uh, is, is going to be really important. Michael, you got a lot of questions about the asset cap on the call. I know you aren't in a position to talk about when that may be lifted. But in the meantime, while it is still in place, where do you see your big growth drivers? Yeah, you know, I think when you look across our businesses, and, and, and a big part of the reason why I came to the company is, you know, we've got really strong positions in a lot of our, a lot of our underlying businesses. And, and that's true today as it was, you know, you know, before I joined. And whether it's in our middle market business, and connecting that better with our investment banking business. It's our wealth management business and really extending more of what we do with our wealth clients in terms of the lending that we can do for them and other banking products we can provide for them. It's better capture of, uh, in our consumer lending uh, business, better capture of the, of the activity that our, bank, our consumer banking clients uh, you know, are doing in, in that space. And so I think there's a lot of opportunity that we're, we think we have embedded within our franchise as we start to execute better uh, across, uh, across the different uh, businesses. Michael, I'm curious, over the last uh, few years that we've had a, a low interest rate environment, but it's been a relatively stable and predictable interest rate environment. Right now, uh, the predictability uh, isn't quite there. Uh, a lot of people not quite sure uh, when rates will rise or how fast they may, may rise. Uh, how is that factoring in right now to your outlook? Yeah, well, I think you know we've seen some of that volatility just even in the last couple of weeks, right? Where we've seen things move around, uh, you know, quite a bit, at least on the long end of uh, the interest rate curve, and and so that that's definitely uh, something we're we're thinking a lot about. But I think it first starts with the economic recovery that we need to see, and I think that's really what's going to drive uh, interest rates up over over time. And so, if you believe the base case that's out there, you know, we, we should start to see some acceleration. You know of that recovery as we get into the middle and the latter uh, part of next year, and all the stimulus that's out there and, and been out there, you know, over the over the last uh, number of months and quarters, I think is important. You know, future stimulus is going to be important, and then all the work that you know we and other banks are doing to really be there to accommodate our clients, uh, I think, as is, is as equally important. That was Mike Santomassimo there, the Wells Fargo Chief Financial Officer. Now, Bloomberg surveillance continues in the next hour. We'll go through some of the market movements, of course, in the U.S. as Martin Luther King Day. So Treasuries, for example, closed. What we'll look at, though, is the inauguration of Joe Biden just two days away from that. We'll look at policy implications and, of course, foreign policy. This is Bloomberg. A new administration begins in America. Joe Biden becomes president on Wednesday. The National Mall will stand empty except for 25,000 troops. Roaring back, growth in China hits pre-pandemic levels. Can it sustain them? And the UK shuts its borders this week to anyone who has not tested COVID negative. The country will step up its mass vaccination program. 
Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London. Tom Keen off today for everyone who's watching from the U.S. or of American nationality. Happy Martin Luther King Day. Now, we look at the markets, we look at politics, we, of course, look at the inauguration. But first, let's get straight to the Bloomberg. First word news in London with me is Leanne Garens. Hi, Leanne. Hi, Francine. Joe Biden is signaling his administration will be tougher on banks. He has picked a pair of veteran regulators to lead two key Wall Street watchdogs. The former head of the Commodity Futures Trading Commission, Gary Gensler, will head the SEC. The FTC member Rohit Chopra is being named to run the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Now, federal authorities are reportedly conducting insider threat screening on the 25,000 National Guard troops coming to to Washington for the inauguration. According to the Washington Post, they are concerned about extremism among the soldiers. A number of pro-Trump rioters who stormed the capital turned out to have links to the military. In China, the economy exceeded its pre-pandemic growth rates in the fourth quarter. GDP rose 6.5% in the final quarter from a year earlier. For all of 2020, China's economy grew 2.3%. That is at a time when major peers such as the US and Japan contracted. The US and the European Union have condemned Russia's decision to detain opposition leader Alexei Navalny. Russian police took Navalny into custody when he arrived in Moscow after being treated in Germany for poisoning. Authorities say he's accused of violating the terms of a suspended sentence. Navalny is an outspoken critic of Russian President Vladimir Putin. Global News 24 hours a day on air and at Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Leanne Gerens. This is Bloomberg. Francine. Leanne, thank you so much. The focus firmly on the data now. Remember, it is Martin Luther King Day, which means that a lot of U.S. markets are closed, including treasuries. What I'm looking at, though, is what we're seeing here in Europe with the concerns of certain markets having access uh, to um, or not having actually enough access to, for example, chip makers. Now, markets uh, mildly risk off on Monday. I'm not sure whether or that's the correct percentage change. Down 4% seems uh, pretty steep. But overall, we did see Carrefour, for example, down some 5%. Other European assets also down significantly. This is more uh, topical because it's certainly a main news that was, for example, uh, squandered because of political intervention. But investors weighing strong economic data from China, what that means for their economy, U.S. President-elect Joe Biden's stimulus plans and surging coronavirus trends will probably be the main topic of the day. Now, President-elect Biden taking the oath of office in a ceremony dramatically reshaped by the pandemic and looming threats of violence in D.C. Bloomberg's Sophia Kai reporting from the nation's capital with preparations for Inauguration Day underway. Downtown D.C. looks like a city preparing for war as officials scramble to fortify the city ahead of Biden's presidential inauguration. Law enforcement officials are really bracing for the worst-case scenario. Huge swaths of the city have been blocked off and 25,000 National Guardsmen have been authorized to be deployed to D.C. Behind me, several National Guardsmen from Pennsylvania are manning a checkpoint on Massachusetts Avenue. The city is on edge. For D.C. residents, journalists, shop owners, and lawmakers, this isn't just the nation's capital, but also where they live and work. It's becoming harder and harder to navigate all the road closures. Some metro stations are closed. Parking garages downtown are closed. And even Capitol Bike Share has been paused temporarily in the Capitol area. So what you're looking at here is a perimeter that's been set up around Capitol Hill. All of a sudden, there are fences and concrete barriers going up everywhere, and armed National Guardsmen patrolling the streets. There's sirens wailing at all hours of the day. The neighborhood has really become a war zone. The inauguration was designated a national special security event. So security preparation was underway a week earlier than planned. The National Mall is where crowds usually gather to watch the inauguration. But this year, it'll be fenced off and closed to the public. The DC mayor has asked that people tune in to the inauguration from the comfort of their homes. And She's asking businesses to download and display signs that say firearms are not welcome. Many downtown stores are putting up plywood and shuttering windows. 
We're currently on 13th and H Street and the streets are completely empty. It's the latest blow for a city that has been shaken by coronavirus lockdowns and Black Lives Matter protests following the murder of George Floyd. Bloomberg, Sophia Kai there on the militarization of Washington, D.C., ahead of the inauguration. Now, we're joined by Jacob Parakilas to talk about U.S. politics. LSE Ideas Associate uh, Professor joins us now. Um, Professor Parakilas, thank you, as always, for, for uh, making us smarter about what we should be thinking and looking at. Does the conversation now change to Biden policies, and what kind of tone will we hear from President-elect Biden on Wednesday? Well, in terms of tone, I think what Biden has signaled throughout the campaign and into the transition period is that he will probably talk about unity. He'll talk about bringing Americans together. Um, he's going to talk about sort of rediscovering a shared national sense of purpose. Um, but I think that's difficult where with the realities. And frankly, if Biden wants to get anything done, he's going to have to move quite quickly. He's going to have to push his caucus in Congress, which controls razor thin majorities in both House and Senate, to do some pretty ambitious things without a lot of uh, disputatiousness. I mean, the, the disadvantage that Biden has relative to the last time he and Barack Obama as president took over amidst the national crisis. 2009 is that the majorities the Democratic Party enjoys in Congress are much smaller. Uh, the advantage he has is there's more of an impetus, there's more of an ideological coherence to the Democratic Party. It's more sort of centered around a, a shared set of uh, policy ideas than the party of 2008, 2009 was. And the fact that you have these three interlocking political crisis, the economic crisis, and the public health crisis, whereas in 2009, it was largely just an economic crisis, um, has, I think, <clears throat> inspired a certain amount of um, uh, sort of uh, impetus amongst the Democrats to get things done quickly, to pass something like the $1.9 trillion stimulus package that Biden has proposed, uh, and to really get moving on addressing these crises. Uh, so I think there'll be a lot of talk of policy, but it's all going to be against this background of um, sort of churning potential political violence, of division, of ongoing disputation from Republicans in Congress and from the right in America generally, uh, who continue to believe against all evidence that uh, Donald Trump, in fact, won. Yeah, is there anything that Joe Biden can actually do to convince people otherwise? Well, not really. I mean, I think the problem with, with facing this kind of uh, organized uh, effort to undermine an election is that the person who, who did, in fact, win the election but is the subject of these conspiracy theories can't really do very much to uh, convince people who are convinced that the, the whole thing was fake, that it was fraud, uh, that it wasn't. I think what he has to do is to try to pass policies that are broadly popular to try to um, fix the, you know, the issues that are facing the country to speed up the vaccination process, to get more uh, stimulus spending into the hands of individuals and small businesses to sort of uh, get things rolling again and to try to undercut the rationale for the, the anger rather than to try to take it on directly. Because frankly, it doesn't matter what he says. The people who are convinced that Trump actually won the election and the whole thing is fraud aren't going to listen to anything Biden says. Uh, Jacob, how does the president, though, try and mend that divide? D does it go through checks? Is it actually retraining people so that they have better prospects? Or, you know, whatever he does, will it actually not make a difference to his popularity with Trump's base? Well, I think, I mean, there are two questions there. There's Biden's overall popularity and there's the Trump space question. I mean, if you're talking about sort of 30% uh, of the country, 30, 35, depending on which poll you're looking at, that still, you know, as of today, thinks that Donald Trump is doing a good job. I don't think there's very much that Biden can do to reach those people. But the, the 15 or 20% sort of in between uh, people who maybe voted for Trump but didn't, uh, don't have strongly negative views against Biden, I think 
um, you know, additional stimulus spending, particularly direct payments to people, but also things like an expansion of the uh, the eviction moratorium, things like uh, loan low interest loans to small businesses that have been badly impacted by the pandemic, keep them open. I think the kind of things, and of course, you know, again, the vaccination program, the most important thing of all, making it possible for the U.S. to return to something like normalcy. Um, I think those things will uh, build him a certain amount of goodwill. But again, you know, against this backdrop of of extreme, extreme disputatiousness about the, the basic fundamental facts of American democracy right now. What are you expecting Donald Trump to do in the next couple of days? Well, there's a lot of talk that he's going to issue us another round of pardons um, in the next day or two. That, I think, is the, the major thing that we're waiting for. Um, he may also issue some executive orders, but the problem for him with executive orders is that Biden can undo them at a stroke, at the stroke of a pen, um, especially you know, given that we're within the last 60 days, there's a, a law that allows Congress to review any last-minute regulatory changes and overrule them. Um, so I think that some of the regulatory changes that have been happening that the Trump administration has tried to push through will be uh, overturned very quickly. Um, Trump, you know, I would expect he'll go back to Florida. That seems to be the, the um, plan from his administration that he'll go there. Uh, without a Twitter account, he'll be somewhat limited in how he can communicate. But I wouldn't be surprised if he starts giving interviews or starts calling in to uh, his favorite media channels, uh, which at one point were Fox. He seems to have soured on Fox and is moving more towards that OAN. So I'd expect to see him trying to get out public communications, continuing to contest the election, continuing to um, gin up sort of anger against Biden and the belief that the election, which was legitimate, was in fact fraudulent. Um, I, I would expect that kind of thing. I mean, the, the big question for Trump is what kind of legal consequences, uh, which have been delayed by the fact that he's been sitting president, are going to accumulate now that, you know, as of Wednesday at 12.01 p.m., he won't be. Um, and I think he and his lawyers have got to be spending some time thinking about that right now. Are you expecting him to, to pardon himself, or is it actually legal for the president to pardon himself? Um, no one knows, because it's never been tried. Um, I think the, the latest reporting is that his lawyers have been strongly dissuading him from trying to pardon himself, because, first of all, it would essentially invite some kind of uh, indictment. They, the DOJ, I think, would... would view it as necessary to indict him uh, in order to try to knock down the precedent of self-pardon, which is a very dangerous precedent to set, that the president can commit crimes and just pardon himself. Um, I think you know, it would be it would be challenged. My my belief is that it would be knocked down by the courts, but I don't know that for sure. As I say, it's never been it's never been tried in court. There's absolutely no precedence to uh, to consider in, in the possibility. Um, I suspect if you if you ask me to guess at this stage, I would suspect that he doesn't go through with it because, first of all, a lot of the legal danger he's facing doesn't come from the federal government. It comes from New York, and we've learned lately potentially Georgia state prosecutions, which he has, he has no ability to pardon himself against. It comes from lawsuits, and then there's the financial danger of the damage to his brand, his income. Um, a self-pardon doesn't really help him with any of that, and it gets rid of his ability to uh, plead the fifth and avoid self-incrimination. So there are, there are genuine legal reasons why he might not try, even if you believe that uh, the concept it would, would go through, that the Supreme Court would ultimately rule it a possibility. Great. Jacob, thank you so much. Jacob Carpilas there, LSE Ideas Associate, joining us this morning to talk about inauguration. Now, coming up next, we speak with Simon French, Panier Gordon, Chief Economist. We talk about the UK, the EU, and of course, the US and China. This is Bloomberg. We're going to have very fast nominal GDP growth. We haven't had that during past recoveries. And so the way you deal with that recovery um, from a central bank perspective has to be different. And it, clearly the, the Fed um, is taking all these inputs in. Um, from our standpoint, I mean, we own you know, 150 to 200 companies around the world globally. And what um, we see is, is a, an economy that will be poised to grow quite strongly coming into uh, the second half of 2021. 
That was Henry McVeigh, KKR head of global macro and asset allocation at KKR, discussing uh, the outlook for the economy with Bloomberg's Eric Schatzker. Now, joining us to talk about the global economy is Simon French. He's Penier Gordon, chief economist. Simon, as always, great to speak to you. So thank you so much uh, for coming on surveillance today. Now, I don't know whether I should start with China and the fact that we had some pretty encouraging figures from China and whether that actually makes a difference to the rest of the world. Well, look, it's uh, a one economy in the world that has grown in 2022, we mustn't lose sight of that. I think two slight reasons just to be cautious. First of all, this has been a pivot from demand from consumers of the world over from services, which they haven't been able to consume in anything like the same volume, towards goods. And of course, China has been the big beneficiary as the global preeminent factory of manufactured goods. But then also the way that China has achieved this growth, it has reverted to the old models, drivers of, uh, of growth, rather than the areas it is trying to prioritise, at least pre-pandemic. So some structural um, regression there, if you like. But we shouldn't be too critical of an economy, probably the only major economy, that has managed to squeeze out growth in the last 12 months. Simon, where do you see the biggest danger lying? Is it too much inflation that maybe could pop up? Um, and are we confusing reflation towards inflation? Or is it more of a double dip recession worldwide? Yeah, I mean, if we take the conversations I've had with clients, inflation is where the conversation starts and ends at the moment. So certainly from an investor standpoint, you really can't deviate from how inflation will evolve. I think I can be fairly confident, uh, you know, as, as confident as anything, that you can uh, see some inflation in the second half of the year that's quite significant as a result of significant base effects. The fact that against a very depressed economy in the middle and second half of 2020, you're going to see some big year-on-year -year changes. But then the question shifts to the much harder question of how sustained that is into 2022 and beyond, whether it'll start to fuel a wage price spiral, whether supply chains will shorten. I think that's much more of an open question. Our own view is that inflation is more likely to be a transitory risk for investors rather than a sustained return to the kind of inflationary prints we saw pre the global financial crisis. Uh, Simon, how long does it take actually to go back to what we had pre-financial crisis? I mean, are we out of the wood when we get to that level or do we need to also make up for the year lost? Well, certainly, if you're trying to understand the Fed, Federal Reserve's uh, policy response function, understanding how much of that uh, foregone inflation below 2% they're prepared to allow the US economy to overheat is absolutely integral to the path. I think they're going to be quite tolerant, given where um, spare capacity is in the United States economy, how much they want the recovery to, recovery to be entrenched, not just amongst the sort of the, uh, the educated, the sort of high income earning households, but also right down the, the threshold, really squeezing out low levels of unemployment amongst uh, minorities, low skilled workers. I think you're, you're likely to see the Fed very, very accommodative and therefore being prepared to play catch up over a number of years in terms of inflation. But it's just the structural changes to higher rates of inflation are going to take a long, long time if we are going to see shorter supply chains, if we are going to see a rollback on globalisation, if we are going to see a greater unionisation of the workforce. These are not overnight changes. Okay. Are, are you expecting supply chains to change even more, Simon, than what we had in the last four or five years? So what we're going to see around the world, I think, is a series of public inquiries. Uh, they will take two different guises, but they will all inc conclude similar sort of things that uh, a nation state's uh, ability to manufacture, to source strategically important parts uh, of the economy, be it uh, in the area of healthcare, pharma, chemicals. We will see those supply chains, I think, shortened based on the recommendations of those public inquiries. But from a macro perspective, if you're looking for a pickup of inflation driven by much shorter supply chains across a much wider suite of goods, I think that's much less likely. And that's the reason why we're still quite skeptical that you're going to see a sustained pickup in global inflation as a result of a big shift in global supply chains. All right, Simon, thank you so much. Simon French there of Panier Gordon stays with us. We'll have plenty more to talk about, including the EU. Now, coming up in the next hour, Tom Kinmonth. He is ABN AMRO Senior Fixed Income Strategist. So that's at 6 a.m. in New York, 11 a.m. in London. And this is Bloomberg.
This is Bloomberg Surveillance. I'm Leanne Gerrans with the Bloomberg Business Flash. The French water company is getting some help as it tried to fight off a takeover attempt by its arch rival Veolia. Two private equity firms, Ardian and Global Infrastructure Partners, are ready to offer $13.7 billion for Suez. The company does support the proposal. Veolia says it has no intention of selling the 30% stake it holds in Suez. Now, Bloomberg has learned that Citrix Systems is in advanced talks to buy work management platform company Reich. The price, more than $2 billion. Reich is owned by buyout firm Vista Equity Partners. A deal could be reached this week. And that's your Bloomberg Business Flash. Francine. Thank you so much, Leanne. Now, the focus firmly on maybe some of the risks out there, but also some of the positive news, including what we saw from China. So let's get straight to the markets. Again, thin volumes because it is Martin Luther King Day in the U.S., which means that, for example, treasuries are closed. The focus, I want to show you what U.S. equities are doing, the equity futures, uh, I need to say. Uh, mildly risk off today, investors weighing strong economic data from China. But at the same time, they're looking at Joe Biden's stimulus plans and surging coronavirus trends. We'll have plenty more on that throughout the day. This is Bloomberg. We hope to have uh, stable interlocutors because exactly for the reason you were mentioning, Italy will be crucial for the success of this uh, European next generation plan. Uh, and we need stable interlocutors. Several uh, European countries will not probably uh, be back in 2022 at the uh, level of growth they uh, expected, but even at the level of growth that they already had at the end of 2019. If this will be the case, uh, there will be also a case for uh, further uh, extraordinary uh, measures. That was uh, Paolo Gentiloni, European Commissioner for the Economy, speaking to us a bit earlier. Now we're back with Simon French of Panmure, Gordon. Simon, when you look at Europe and some of the difficulties for the vaccine rollout, are you assuming that we're going to see a double dip recession? Yes. Um, the more difficult challenge is to know what we policy response function to that double dip recession will be because um, there are three uh, actors at play here. There's the, um, the rollout of the vaccine, which we know has got off to a poor start with little sign of an improvement in recent days. Um, monetary policy already close to being sort of constrained in terms of the additional support that can be provided to financing conditions. And fiscal policy, you know, yes, there are teething problems with the pan-European bailout package, but actually it remains the area that if there is a double dip, there will be greater clamour for that to be more ambitious uh, and with the necessary sort of political trade-offs that come with that. Not exactly what the Commission wants in their intro right now. Where do you see the, the biggest concern in Europe? I mean, there's, you know, once again, possible political instability in Italy. Could Italy once again be, you know, the, the worst uh, student in class? And what does that mean of, you know, how the Commission should deal with them? Well, Paolo Gentilini's comments were, I mean, if you take the data points that he uh, talked about, you know, not being back at pre-COVID outputs by the end of 2022, you're know, not achieving the sort of growth rates. Well, unfortunately, if you look at the Italian economy in the last 20 years, um, it really hasn't grown in real terms over that period. So I'm not sure it hugely changes your baseline, but of course it is, and I think this is key for a lot of the sort of policy questions for, for investors, you know, the relative pace of recovery versus what you already had as your structural growth rate is probably the differentiating feature. And the worry, therefore, in Italy, if it is slower, is the contagion that we've always spoken about as non-performing loan rates pick up, the permeation into the corporate sector. That would be where I'd have worries that, you know, you're going to see not just a kind of for aggregate fiscal policy, but more targeted sectoral interventions. What does Brexit actually mean for the EU? Is it going to be, are we going to see as market-friendly reform because they lost the UK driving force? 
Well, we've spoken about this, haven't we, for the last four and a half years as to, you know, generally tended to focus, haven't we, on the UK's uh, questions. But you're absolutely right. There is a uh, key question for the more pro-market, what is classified tend to be the Northern European Scandi bloc, whether they have uh, a, they've lost a friend in terms of you, you, the UK that has generally over the last 40 years supported those. But there is, as there has been for a number of years, a question mark over whether Europe pursues closer integration on its fiscal policy, on its political system, or takes a more divergent view and back to perhaps the origins of the single market and the European Union back in the early 90s. Uh, I, I think the question for, for, for Europe without the United Kingdom is whether it chooses to um, you know, uh, aggregate together um, or, or split apart rather than necessarily a regulatory or, or sort of, you know, or a regulatory model or a deregulatory model. Where do you see the UK heading from here, Simon? Uh, so the big question I'm being asked from investors uh, for the UK is, are these teething problems with Brexit near term just an adjustment function? So we knew there was going to be a new rule book on the 1st of January, which was going to impede uh, you know, cross-border flows of trade. But will, as that adjustment takes place, those frictions melt away? And also, as the political heat dials down, will you have more pragmatism in terms of the engagement between EU partners and the United Kingdom? That's my base uh, expectation that you'll see a dial down in those frictions and the tension, which will lead to a much more pragmatic approach to how trade flows take place. Um, but there are big issues on you know, data equivalents, uh, on uh, financial services equivalents, where actually there are still uh, big um, divergences of how markets should be regulated that the UK and the EU need to address in 2021. So it certainly hasn't gone away for investors. Um, Simon, th there's also, you know, talk or rumours in the media that the Chancellor will raise um, taxes in April. I if we go back to austerity too quickly, how much of a mistake or not would that be? So I think this would be unwise for the Chancellor in the first week of March to tighten the fiscal envelope. The UK is unlikely to have materially eased restrictions on the wider economy. I think more, much more likely that the Chancellor will want to lay out a fiscal framework, a set of fiscal rules on how the deficit is brought down from 15, maybe even 20% of GDP back to something more manageable longer term. But near term, raising taxes, cutting spending would be uh, particularly unwise, as we really don't know, as the furlough scheme unwinds, potentially the end of April, how many of the about four to five million Britons who are currently furloughed will have viable jobs to go back to. So, so not the time, and I don't think the Chancellor will do this in early March, even though he's, there's a, quite a lot of speculation in the press this morning. Um, Simon, very quickly, what kind of level, if you look at currencies, what's mo most interesting? Is it euro dollar or euro sterling? A euro dollar for me, um, euro dollar and the uh, suggestion, perhaps more tighter restrictions from the Biden administration, more of a, uh, a risk off appetite from investors pushing uh, appetite back to the dollar in recent days. I think that trend has a little bit further to run, actually. So that, that's the interesting cross rate for me. Simon, we keep on hearing actually from all corners, from China, but also the EU, they want to rival, I guess, the dollar longer term as a reserve currency. When, you know, when do we actually start talking about that as something that could happen sooner rather than later? All right, so two big problems with those two economic areas. One, if we had to also Christine Lagarde with us on the show this morning, she wouldn't really relish the appreciation impact that the greater role of the euro in as a global reserve currency would have in terms of supporting growth, supporting hitting the ECB's inflation target. So I'm not convinced, even though there's a, perhaps a geopolitical case, it's necessarily an economic case that most European policymakers will support. And in China, it's a very different story in terms of the, uh, the degree to which a global reserve currency needs to have unfettered liquidity, unfettered movement of capital. That's not something that Chinese policymakers will hugely relish. So I, mean, I think this remains something that's a theoretical debate rather than actually a practical debate near term.
Thank you so much, Simon French, Sarah Panier, Gordon, Chief Economist. Now let's get straight to the Bloomberg First Word News in London with me is Leanne Gerrans. Hi, Leanne. Hi, Francine. Two veteran regulators strongly backed by progressive Democrats have been picked to head two key Wall Street watchdogs. The former head of the Commodity Futures Trading Commission, Gary Gensler, will head the SEC. FTC member Rohit Chopper is being named to run the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Now, Joe Biden's inauguration speech on Wednesday will have several themes. The incoming president is expected to outline how he'll tackle the health and economic crisis he inherits. At the same time, Biden will call on the U.S. to abandon the divisiveness stoked by President Trump. He's been sworn in two weeks after the riot at the Capitol. Now, the White House is planning a farewell for Donald Trump on Wednesday when he leaves Washington for the last time as president. Bloomberg News has seen a copy of the invitation. The event will take place at Joint Base Andrews, where the outgoing president will make his departure on Air Force One. It's scheduled four hours before Joe Biden is actually sworn in. There are global gaps in access to coronavirus vaccines, and that's raising concerns that the continued spread of the disease will breed more dangerous versions of the pathogen. The US, Britain and European Union have given citizens about 24 million doses so far. That's more than half of the shots administered globally. Some countries haven't yet started their campaigns. Global News 24 hours a day on air and at Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Leanne Gerrans. This is Bloomberg. Francine. Leanne, thank you so much. Now, coming up in the next hour, John Stilidis, geopolitical strategist at Trilogy Advisors and diplomacy consultancy for the Department of State under contract. That's coming up 6.30 a.m. in New York, 11.30 a.m. in London. And this is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance. You're looking at the principal room. Coming up today, Dr. Stott Rissmiller, Ortham Health System Chief Physician Executive. The overall uh, the quarter uh, really uh, seems to have uh, shown that uh, economy has ended the year on a strong note. Uh, the manufacturing is doing well. In terms of Chinese data, very much in line with expectations, very positive for the country and the region. The thing we're watching out for is uh, whether the PBOC is actually going to continue maintaining a very tight policy uh, in the face of an, of an economy which is uh, potentially on the brink of deflation. Well, China was the only global nation to avoid a contraction. Economists expect China to continue to outpace peers this year. Well, joining us now is Morad Olgan, HSBC Global Head of EM Research on HSBC's latest EM Sentiment Survey. Morad, always thank you for joining us. When you look at China, the fact that it's growing 6.5%, does it actually help the rest of the world or not? That's a very good question, Francis, and thank you for having me. Uh, I think it does. You know, we have seen in the past the Chinese cycle recovering is actually helping the rest of global trade, commodities. Commodity prices have been rising over the past few months. December has been a great month. Uh, obviously, you know, we're still in this environment impacted by COVID. You know, China is producing the goods that the world needs, be it consumer electronics, healthcare equipment, and other stuff. Uh, but as over time, um, the growth pattern passes to the rest of the world and China continues to recover, especially the underperforming areas like domestic consumption, retail sales, you know, we may get into a better global growth environment. I think the short answer is yes. And there are various channels that it does help EM, like global trade, like commodities, etc. Um, Murat, if you look at, I guess, you know, when China will start spending and actually helping the world grow that way, how far is that away? Um, I think we're still in an environment where in China, manufacturing, production and exports are outperforming the other parts of the economy, like retail sales, as we saw in December number this morning, and domestic consumption. I think um, the rest will depend 
uh, obviously on the labor market, which is improving in China, but also disposable income growth, which we expect to improve and pick up as the year advances. As that's the case, and domestic consumption uh, gains ground, I think there will be more imports in China from the rest of the world. Uh, I think at the moment there is also investments in manufacturing, which would benefit capital goods producers and exporters as well. Um, so this, this is a recovery uh, that is gaining pace, clearly evident in today's number, fourth quarter beating expectations. And as the year goes by, we think other parts of the economy will join it, especially the domestic side, and it will generate uh, import demand from the rest of the world. What is the, your, your biggest concern about China? Is it policy action or is it something else? We actually don't think that uh, policy easing will be tapered anytime soon because, yes, the recovery is gaining pace. It is improving. For this year, we're actually looking for 8.5% growth, which is above China's potential, which is very solid. But despite that, we're not looking for uh, monetary policy easing to change course because you have inflation fairly low. Core inflation is actually 0.4%. Yes, the PPI has gotten less negative recently, but it's still negative. It's been negative for quite a while. Um, and overall inflation is still low. It was actually negative. Now it turned positive in December. So with low inflation, even though recovery is gaining pace, we don't think the policy course will change. So that's not our worry. We think that the one-year loan prime rate will remain at 3.85% the whole year. Uh, Murat, you also have this uh, emerging market sentiment survey. And in that, I think respondents actually expect emerging markets to perform quite well and also that we begin to see inflation in there. Is this emerging markets as a whole or do you have to pick what countries you like? That's a very good question. Overall responses is like three quarters of investors are now bullish on EM prospects over the next three months. Uh, we are doing this quarterly survey across uh, a pretty wide range of institutional investors. The previous one is in September, and the bullishness was uh, around the half of the investors. Now it's three quarters, so clearly a sort of a top-down pickup. Uh, but at the same time, investors still harboring pretty large amount of cash. Um, and, uh, you know, one quarter actually expects that cash levels to go down, so put more cash to work, which means, you know, this optimism may actually translate into action as well. In terms of country choices, this is our third survey, started in June last year, September, and, and this one was conducted in uh, the sec started second half of November until early 2021. Uh, pretty much in all three surveys, Asia and China leads the pack as the most favorite region. But for the first time in this survey, we are actually seeing some rotation, friends. And now we are seeing investors preferring other countries and regions, in particular Latin America. The overweight positioning in Latin America has nearly doubled from our September survey. So clearly some optimism regarding Latin America, perhaps on the back of rising commodity prices. Great. Thank you so much. And we're at Olgin there, HSBC Global Head of EM Research. Now, coming up in the next hour, Joshua Sharstein, Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health Vice Team. We want to talk about vaccines and what we've learned in the last two to three weeks. That interview is 6.30 a.m. in New York, 11.30 a.m. in London. And this is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance. I'm Leanne Gerrans with the Bloomberg Business Flash. In South Korea, Samsung Electric Air J. Lee has been spent back to prison for 30 months in a bribery case. It's a dramatic setback for the world's largest electronics company. Samsung has been trying to move beyond a years-long scandal. Lee was first jailed in 2017 after being convicted for his role in a corruption case. Now, Goldman Sachs has raised its growth forecast for the U.S. this year and beyond. The upgrade is fueled by the expectation that a Biden administration will deliver large amounts of state fiscal aid and education and health spending. Goldman predicts the economy will expand 6.6 percent this year, up from 6.4 percent in a previous forecast. And the Trump administration has reportedly lashed out again at China, according to Reuters. The U.S. has told several of Huawei technology suppliers that it is revoking licenses to work with the Chinese company. The U.S. has been arguing that Huawei is a threat to national security. And that's your Bloomberg Business Flash. Francine.
Well, yeah, thank you so much. Now we're back with Nord Olgan of HSBC to talk about emerging markets. We were talking about China after we had that GDP figure, but also the EM uh, sentiment survey that Murat and his team has put together. Murat, we're talking a little bit about where you find the best value in EM. Overall, if you look at currencies, how much will investor appetite play through currencies instead of fixed income or even equities? Yes, so uh, investors appear to be more optimistic on sort of growth sensitive assets like EM equities and EM currencies. In particular, when it comes to EMFX, the optimism has increased a lot compared to our September survey. Those investors who are expecting appreciation in EMFX in the near term has almost doubled compared to September survey. Um, and those currencies, um, I mean, the Asian currencies generally stand out, but other currencies are also making into the favorite list as well. For instance, Russian ruble or Brazilian real. Um, are also becoming favorite currencies. Latin America is an interesting region, as we discussed before. Uh, there is a rotation from Asia to Latin America, and Latin America is preferred when it comes to external debt and EMFX. So there, there is some optimism with regards to EMFX for this year as well. Murat, when you look at you know dollar dynamics, what are you actually expecting dollar to do from here until the end of the year? And are some of these, or most of these emerging markets, actually a dollar play? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. No, it's an excellent point and, you know, fair point. It's obviously a very important factor for EMFX. Now, our FX strategies are looking for generally soft, if not slightly weaker dollar, but only modest weakness, not a structural weakness. We got euro dollar 126 at the end of the year, which is sort of has become a benchmark, you know, when, when weaving the direction of the dollar. Although they do think that the opportunities in, in FX are uh, more in the EM space rather than the EM against the dollar. And obviously, you know, since the, the, this is sort of a consensus expecting weakness in the dollar, and the last week uh, was a bit of a surprise in that regard. Uh, but I think the expectation is still as the advances uh, that this is going to be a relatively benign soft dollar backdrop for EMFX. But based on our studies, what we have found out is actually what's what's more important for EMFX is growth. So that's the first factor that drives EMFX. We talked about China which is lifting up uh, a growth out again. This is impacting the rest of EM and, and should do so going forward. So based on our previous econometric analysis, global growth and EM growth are very important factors for EMFX to perform, for fund flows to EM to resume and strengthen. Uh, and obviously, dollar is important as well, but I look at both. I look at EM growth, global growth, and the dollar at the same time. I mean, what about the impact of the U.S. elections? So how will that impact emerging markets uh, depending on what Joe Biden does with foreign policy? Yeah. Now, it's interesting because uh, we, we asked this question in the sentiment survey as well, and obviously the answers are pretty fresh. And uh, what, was, what was interesting to me is, uh, you know, when we did the survey, the Georgia runoff results weren't there. But when we presented investors with alternatives, they actually thought... Um, Joe Biden presidency and a, and a, and a Congress, a Senate uh, controlled by Democrats, uh, is generally positive for EM. But one quarter of the investors said this could actually be negative in the near term. I think this is because of these mixed signals that this outcome is sending. On the one hand, as you mentioned, there is this economic policy, potentially much bigger fiscal stimulus coming out of U.S., which should be great for EM because EM can export a lot to the U.S., be it commodities, be it other products, electronics, etc., but on the other hand, a stronger recovery in the U.S. is lifting up the rates. And if that tightens global financial conditions, that would be bad for EM. That's probably where the split views are coming from investors. Although on our side, we don't expect, you know, U.S. rates to rise. If anything, actually, we're looking for lower rates as the year advances. Maura, thank you so much. Maura Olgan, their HSBC Global Head of EM Research. Now, tune in also to our special coverage of inauguration of Joe Biden. That's 11 a.m. New York time on Wednesday. This is Bloomberg. A new administration begins in America. Joe Biden becomes president Wednesday. The National Mall will stand empty except for 25,000 troops. Roaring back, a growth in China hits pre-pandemic levels. Can it sustain them? And the UK shuts its borders this week to anyone who has not tested negative for COVID. The country will step up its mass vaccination program. 
Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London. Of course, it's Martin Luther King Day, so a quieter markets, and Tom Keane is off today. Now, let's get straight to the Bloomberg First Word News. Here's Leanne Gerrans. Hi, Leanne. Hi, Francine. Joe Biden is signaling his administration will be tougher on banks. He's picked a pair of veteran regulators to lead two key Wall Street watchdogs. The former head of the Commodity Futures Trading Commission, Gary Gensler, will head the SEC. FTC member Rohit Chopra is being named to run the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Now, federal authorities are reportedly conducting insider threat screening on the 25,000 National Guard troops coming to Washington for the inauguration. According to the Washington Post, they're concerned about extremism among the soldiers. A number of pro-Trump rioters who stormed the Capitol turned out to have links to the military. In China, the economy exceeded its pre-pandemic growth rates in the fourth quarter. GDP rose 6.5 percent in the final quarter from a year earlier. For all of 2020, China's economy grew 2.3 percent. That's at a time when major peers such as the US and Japan both contracted. And the US and the European Union have condemned Russia's decision to detain opposition leader Alexei Navalny. Russian police took Navalny into custody when he arrived in Moscow after being treated in Germany for poisoning. Authorities say he's been accused of violating terms of a suspended sentence. Navalny is an outspoken critic of Russian President Vladimir Putin. Global News 24 hours a day on air and at Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Leanne Gerrans. This is Bloomberg. Francine. Leanne, thank you so much. So let's go straight to the data. And a reminder, of course, U.S. equities are closed because of Martin Luther King there. So are treasuries. But we can always look at futures. The focus is firmly on coronavirus cases rising across the world. The focus is also on the dollar. Now, U.S. equity futures were trading just like uh, a couple of European stocks, but it's pretty much unchanged. Changed. I'm looking at not only strong economic data from China, but the fact that U.S. President-elect Joe Biden's stimulus plans, uh, we should find out more in the coming days and weeks. And then these surging coronavirus trends also puts in question uh, the recovery, certainly here in Europe, and whether we're going to see a double-dip recession. Oil prices weaker, and once again, U.S. equity futures dipping. Now, the United States preparing for inauguration, the nation's capital militarized as the country braces for looming threats of violence. Bloomberg's Sophia Kai reports from D.C. Downtown D.C. looks like a city preparing for war as officials scramble to fortify the city ahead of Biden's presidential inauguration. Law enforcement officials are really bracing for the worst case scenario. Huge swaths of the city have been blocked off and 25,000 National Guardsmen have been authorized to be deployed to D.C. Behind me, several National Guardsmen from Pennsylvania are manning a checkpoint on Massachusetts Avenue. The city is on edge. For D.C. residents, journalists, shop owners, and lawmakers, this isn't just the nation's capital, but also where they live and work. It's becoming harder and harder to navigate all the road closures. Some metro stations are closed. Parking garages downtown are closed, and even Capital Bike Share has been paused temporarily in the capital area. So what you're looking at here is a perimeter that's been set up around Capitol Hill. All of a sudden, there are fences and concrete barriers going up everywhere, and armed National Guardsmen patrolling the streets. There's sirens wailing at all hours of the day. The neighborhood has really become a war zone. The inauguration was designated a national special security event. So security preparation was underway a week earlier than planned. The National Mall is where crowds usually gather to watch the inauguration. But this year, it'll be fenced off and closed to the public. The DC mayor has asked that people tune in to the inauguration from the comfort of their homes. And She's asking businesses to download and display signs that say firearms are not welcome. Many downtown stores are putting up plywood and shuttering windows. We're currently on 13th and H Street, and the streets are completely empty. It's the latest blow for a city that has been shaken by coronavirus lockdowns and Black Lives Matter protests following the murder of George 
Bloomberg, Sophia Kai there on the militarization of Washington, D.C. ahead of inauguration. Now, for more, let's bring in Bloomberg's Kathleen Hunter. Kathleen, what are you expecting on inauguration day? Well, I think that's the big question. You know, um, usually these uh, transitions of power are, are more about, you know, the pomp and circumstance and sort of honoring this sort of every four-year tradition of American democracy. This year is looking very, very different. I think if, you know, what happens on Wednesday is Joe Biden uh, goes on the steps of the Capitol, takes the oath of office and, you know, gives a speech and everyone essentially goes home and there's no other event or outstanding event. I think that's everyone is going to be breathing a sigh of relief, but that's not a foregone conclusion as much as it normally is in other past inaugurations that I've covered. Um, Kathleen, what kind of tone will Joe Biden strike on Inauguration Day? Well, we have gotten a preview of his speech, and it does sound like he's going to reprise and expand upon uh, many of the themes that we've heard him use during his campaign about unity and the need to heal the divisions that are that are, uh, you know, plaguing the U.S. currently. Um, we heard him deliver a similar message on January 6th following the riots on Capitol Hill. And so I would expect him to continue to hammer on that kind, those kind of themes. Now, you know, Putting forth that rhetoric will certainly be a shift in tone from what we heard during the Trump administration, but actually, uh, you know, shifting the um, the uh, tone more broadly across the U.S. and moving away from those divisions is going to be easier said than done. Because people believe that Joe Biden did not win the election fairly or for some other reason? Well, I think that's part of it. I mean, there's certainly we did see, um, you know, in the Capitol Hill attacks that we saw on January 6th, we did see that obviously there's a certain number of Americans who firmly believe what the president has been, the current president has been saying, um, you know, since November 2nd and certainly, you know, prior to that, that the election was stolen, that Trump is the legitimate winner. Of course, there are, there are zero facts to back, to back that up at this point. Um, and so, you know, but that is something that belief that's out there. We've even seen members of Congress, members of the House and Senate perpetuating those inaccuracies. And so um, I think that that certainly is a contributing factor to why we're likely to see these deep divisions continue. But I think that, you know, we can see some of the current movements, um, this sort of far right movement that's come to the fore in the U.S. We can see its roots going back to, I think, even the 2010 election, if not earlier, um, which was the Tea Party wave that brought Republicans back into power in the House and I think is broadly seen as a reaction to President Obama's election in 2008. Um, uh, Kathleen, what are you expecting t taxes to do? Or will they rise in the U.S. in the next five to six months? Or, or how difficult is it to actually know that right now? I think it's difficult to know. Um, we did see, obviously, a huge uh, big-ticket stimulus proposal or economic recovery proposal put forth by uh, Joe Biden last week to the tune of $1.9 trillion. Um, you know, I think that certainly the Biden administration is one that's going to be more open to, to potentially increasing taxes, uh, you know, on the wealthy in particular, the highest earners and on corporations. That's something that Joe Biden and Democrats have been interested in doing for quite a while. Um, now, of course, you know, getting that done, getting any kind of big legislative policy through is going to be difficult, even though Democrats control both chambers of Congress now or, or will as of January 20th. It's important to remember that they have the slimmest of margins in the Senate. It's an even 50-50 split with Kamala Harris, the incoming vice president, breaking a tie. And in the House, Nancy Pelosi, the speaker, has an even smaller majority than she did two years ago and or these past two years. And so she's going to have even less of a margin to work with. So I think getting anything done, um, you know, that would be um, of a pretty significant policy uh, scope is going to be quite difficult, especially given that we know that there's going to be this lingering question about an impeachment trial for Trump in the Senate. And Biden's also going to need to get a number of his cabinet nominees confirmed in the early days of the administration. What is the chances of impeachment, Kathy? We've heard from, you know, people close to Joe Biden that he also doesn't want this to take over important work on, on policy. But can, can he actually decide not to take any action, given what we've seen in the last 10 days? Well, I think it's a tricky one because, you know, I think that the calls 
even in Republican circles at this point, um, in more establishment Republican circles, of the Congress taking some kind of an action, particularly given this is an assault on that branch of government and on Capitol Hill itself, there is pretty widespread um, urging to take some kind of action that would hold President Trump accountable. Um, in fact, you know, Majority Leader Mitch McConnell, who's been someone that has been very low to cross Trump for the past four years, has said, has, hasn't ruled out the possibility that he might even vote to convict Trump in an impeachment trial. And so I think the pressure to do that is going to be very significant. That being said, I think Democrats in particular want to do this pretty expeditiously. They wanted to do it even as soon as last week after the House voted. Um, the Senate, you know, which is currently controlled by Republicans didn't allow that to happen. But I think that there's going to be a sense that they want to uh, conduct this trial in the Senate, um, but they want to do it in a pretty quick manner and get it off the table so that they can turn the page and start talking about Joe Biden's policies. But, Kathleen, I think they need 17 uh, Republican senators to, to vote for impeachment to actually convict the president and the Senate. How likely? I mean, it's an enormous task to convince 17 people to vote against him. Absolutely. It's a very heavy lift. And, you know, uh, that's, uh, that's exactly right. It would be 17 Republicans, assuming that all of the Democrats uh, do vote in favor of convicting, which seems like, you know, a reasonably safe assumption. But obviously, we haven't even started the, started the trial yet. And so that number could be bigger at 17 at least. And that being said, I think a lot, again, falls on the question of what does Mitch McConnell do? Because as the Republican leader, he's someone that carries a lot of weight. If he ultimately decides to vote to convict Trump, I think he's going to carry a lot of Republicans with him. And then in that case, we're likely to see potentially, um, you know, the 17 Republicans that, that, w that it would take to convict Trump. I think without McConnell's support, that becomes a much, much bigger ask. Kathleen, thank you so much. Uh, Kathleen Hunter, there, our congressional reporter. Now, coming up next, we also speak with Tom Kinmuth. He's ABN AMRO senior fixed income strategist. We talk about markets. We also talk about inauguration, how that could maybe change Treasury trajectory. This is Bloomberg. very fast nominal GDP growth. We haven't had that during past recoveries. And so the way you deal with that recovery um, from a central bank perspective has to be different. And it, clearly the, the Fed um, is taking all these inputs in. Um, from our standpoint, I mean, we own you know, 150 to 200 companies around the world globally. And what um, we see is, is a, an economy that will be poised to grow quite strongly coming into uh, the second half of 2021. Henry McVeigh there, KKR head of global macro and asset allocation at KKR, discussing the outlook for the economy with our very own Eric Schatzker. Now joining us is Tom Kinmuth. He's ABN AMRO senior fixed income strategist. And Tom, it's great to have you, especially on uh, a couple of weeks where uh, Treasury and Treasury is really dominating the conversation when it comes to fixed income. Tom, where are you expecting Treasuries to be by the summer? Well, I suppose in the end, we've got a huge monetary support coming in. Um, as noted then, we've got a lot of fiscal support coming in in H2. So we've got a big, big push on that side. But on the other side, in, well, central banks across the world are not going to be in any hurry to hike interest rates. Our expectation is maximum 1.5% on the 10-year. It could even be quite a bit lower. Essentially, central banks across the world will want to let their economies overheat. Uh, for a number of years. Either that's in their requirements, whether it's an average interest rate or inflation rate target. And so over time, we've got this huge splurge of monetary spending, fiscal spending on the way, but then also this tendency across the world for central banks to really not raise interest rates. How, by how much can they actually let their economy heat up, Tom? And, and it, it then is your case that we see a bit of inflation, which is more like reflation this year rather than proper inflation? Yeah, I suppose reflation back to where we were, then a big a big push. But two to three years is is not uh, unimaginable. That they they really let it go for quite a long time. If we look at other nations or other areas across the world, for example, in the eurozone, 
that they didn't have that flexibility the US had of being able to reduce interest rates. So in the Eurozone, for example, we could be looking at a long, long time before they can rewind the other benefits that they were given, such as TLTRO or huge asset purchases. And so that the US won't be in any, any rush if, if the rest of the, um, the environment is not hiking interest rates either. So it could be a good two to three years we see of just wanting to allow the economies to gain back the momentum, trying to offset a lot of the labor market weakness that we may begin to see feed through. Uh, provisioning also is expected to increase for the banking sector. And then a little bit of a reversal of the huge other stimulus supports that have been going on. So it definitely could be two to three years of um, continued support by central banks, really to try and bring their economies back to where they were, and then just to try and act as some impetus going forward. Tom, what does that mean for Treasury levels then? Well, in the end, there's that tendency, that there's that demand and wish from investors that they go back up. They go back up to somewhere we were, were before. But on the other side, we have to take the reality of the, this lower for longer. There's a lot of negative inflation dynamics going on. We've got huge debt increases, not, not just from this, this fiscal spending now, but just in general across economies. Aging demographics, we've got negative rates in other regions. And once this splurge begins to show, it could have maybe hidden the, the structural reforms that we need needed for inflation. Now, before we had all of this, outside of the US, structurally, inflation was very weak in a lot of regions. And so it's, it's trying to combine that big positive benefit of the monetary and the fiscal, uh, fiscal side, how much that will then structurally change the dynamics. The US is obviously in a very good position with the vaccine program underway, the ability it ha has against the very downward pressure the central banks are going to be putting on, on, on rates for maybe five to 10 years on that side. I know, Tom, this is not a story for 2021, and you say not even for 2022, but when it comes to raising interest rates because of inflation or because, you know, it's, it, the, the economy is just too hot, who will have the most difficulty in terms of major central banks to readjust and adapt? Um, I think the Eurozone, by, by a long way. Um, they, they, they didn't have that ability to cut rates. That has meant that they forced to do, for example, two trillion of lending to the Eurozone banking sector. That's equivalent to about the GDP of Italy, um, just on that side. QE programs, absolutely massive, covered bond purchases over the majority holder now. And they've just got to reverse a little bit of that before they can even begin to consider the structural issues they had on inflation. Now, for inflation, you obviously need a good wage market. You need that to be going for a good few periods before inflation begins to see. There's been no significant structural reforms. If anything, the ECB involvement over the last five to six years has, has stop those kind of um, structural reforms within the periphery. And they've got the biggest, the biggest task there. Throw on top aging demographics, the banking sector trying to deal with negative rates. That is going to be a real um, tough cookie going forward, I think, for the Eurozone to really begin to start increasing interest rates. And as you alluded to there, obviously all this debt that's been taken on now is it's not going to be in a great position if interest rates begin to increase. The last thing the Eurozone wants to do is, is finance this fiscal spending that we're seeing in Italy, putting the government debt to GDP up over 150%. The last thing they want to do then is to increase interest rates and reverse potentially right. what work they've done. So what does it mean for fixed, you know, the, some of the yields that we're seeing in Europe? Is this something, Tom, that you would be looking to, to stay away from? Or what looks more attractive in the fixed income space worldwide right now? Yeah, the big story, investment grade, euro denominated debt, 60 percent is sovereign debt. Um, that's all, all below zero on average, apart from Italy. Italy is the, that diamond in the crown, which is keeping rates very low for them, considering the weak fundamentals. But for us, credit is the area to be. Credit is under 20% of that index, so quite a small amount of uh, compared to the general area. You've got a lot of investors that have to look for some yield to make up for the fees they're charging. They're just coming into credit. And on our side, it's the high risk still. Um, in bank side, it's the AT1s, the subordinated debt, 3 or 4%. Um, because we believe in this lower for longer and the negative scenarios, very flat curves, we're trying to take as much risk um, down the ranks of debt. And for us, that's the area where it's a bit of the sweet spot for investors trying to pick up at the moment. Tom, thank you so much. Uh, Tom Kinmanth there, ABN AMRO Senior Fixed Income Strategist. Now, don't miss our special coverage of the inauguration of Joe Biden. It's Wednesday, starting at 11 a.m. in New York. That's 4 p.m. in London. And this is Bloomberg.
This is Bloomberg Surveillance. I'm Leanne Gerrins with the Bloomberg Business Flash. Shares of Carrefour are falling today. That's after Canada's Couchetard abandoned talks for a $20 billion takeover of the French grocer. France's finance minister publicly opposed the deal. The government may have been concerned about the potential impact on Carrefour's employees and suppliers. Bloomberg has learned that Citrix Systems is in advance talks to buy work management platform company Reich. The price, more than $2 billion. Reich is owned by buyout firm Vista Equity Partners. A deal could be reached as soon as this week. And that's your Bloomberg Business Flash, Francine. Thank you so much, Leanne. Now, the focus firmly on dollar with a lot of, of course, stocks in the U.S., but also Treasury closed because of Martin Luther King Day. So the focus is not only on inauguration, but some of the policies put in place by Joe Biden. Uh, but the focus is also on coronavirus cases going up, which is why we're seeing a move sideways with maybe a little bit of risk off mood. Coming up, Jeff Henriksen, Thorpe Abbott's Capital Chief Executive and University of Oxford Associate Fellow. This is Bloomberg. It would seem to me a more focused attempt to, to target the money to the sectors that need it more uh, would uh, have a more positive outcome for the economy. But uh, nevertheless, um, you know, there, that is a lot of stimulus. Uh, a lot of it will get spent. Some of it will get saved. Once we get past uh, the pandemic, I think some of that savings will get released because people are building precautionary balances. And, uh, you know, we could be entering, a, a, you know, a, a golden age. That was Scott Minard, Guggenheim Global Chief Investment Officer, discussing Biden's stimulus proposal. Now, joining us now to discuss uh, some of the policies as well put in place by uh, Joe Biden in the coming months, Jeff Henriksen, he's Thorpe Abbott's Capital Chief Executive Officer and University of Oxford Associate Fellow. Jeff, thank you for joining us uh, on a day like today where uh, we take stuff, <laughs> a stock of exactly what Joe Biden can do and some of the challenges ahead. Right. You know, how much time does Joe Biden have to actually put some of these policies in place? Well, I mean, I think we've had, um, you know, the good news is we already have stimulus that's already come down the pipe. So, um, but, but so the sooner the better, I think. Uh, you know, I was thinking about this yesterday. The, the, one of the interesting things about the, the COVID crisis is that, um, you know, just given the exogenous nature of the shock that we've seen, um, the, I think you're going to see a much, and you're already seeing a much stronger follow through uh, on fiscal stimulus than you did. Uh, coming out of the last recession, 08, 09. Now, obviously, then it was a, a bit of a different situation. Obviously, well, very different situation. You had a balance sheet recession, essentially, and a private sector deleveraging. And I think um, policymakers like Bernanke back in the day probably would have liked to have seen stronger follow through on the fiscal front uh, in, in terms of fiscal stimulus. But I think this time you're, you've already seen what? I think $4 trillion or so prior to the 1.9. And, and then the interesting thing is, is there's uh, um, even talk about more beyond that as, as you look at potential infrastructure uh, spend. So I, I think that the, the fiscal stimulus backdrop is one of the strongest structural uh, factors that are driving uh, the market right now, and I think it'll continue to drive it. Um, Jeff, where you see, you know, these record level of stimulus, as you laid out very clearly, is there anything that makes you think that these markets will not be supported in 2021? Do you worry about rising inflation? Do you worry about valuations or, you know, equity markets or other places uh, too hot? Well, so I, I think the best way I could answer that is uh, to give an example. Uh, actually, right before I come on the air with you guys, uh, I, I pulled up on my terminal. I looked at, I was looking at some fixed income. And I pulled up a UPS bond uh, that matured in, uh, I believe it was 2030, a uh, senior unsecured claim. And at, based on the current market price, it's trading, trading at a yield of maturity of, uh, I think it was just around 1.7%, just under 1.7%. Um, so said another way, uh, it's trading at, at, at about just under a 60 times PE ratio, if you want to think about it that way, for, um, for a cash flow that's, that's, that's not going to grow, guaranteed not to grow, and it's not going to protect you against inflation. So when, uh, when you mentioned valuations, if I look at the S&P 500, say, and I see a lot of people that are concerned about valuations there, uh, when I see a 22 Ford multiple or 23 Ford multiple, uh, depending how you calculate it, uh, and I compare that to what, you know, what I'm having to pay to, to own a, a bond on something like UPS, I think this environment sets up very well for equities uh, going forward. Now, you're right to be concerned if, if we did see potential inflation or, or uh, that interest rate environment change, some of those dynamics would change. But given where we are right now, I just think 
uh, it, it still sets up extremely well for equities, given both fiscal monetary stimulus and relative valuation relative to, uh, to uh, bonds and fixed income. Okay, are, are there new investors entering the markets and how does that change the dynamics? Yeah, so this is something we've been giving a lot of thought about. Um, you know, if you, uh, if you go back and look at history in the 90s, that, that last leg of the big bull market uh, from, you know, 83 to 2004 was really driven by the individual investor. And, and I think you might see something similar here. Uh, you know, you have an entire generation of millennials that are uh, becoming more interested in investing. And some of that is, is obviously around being at home and, and, and having stimulus and getting, you know, more interested in stocks because, you know, you're stuck on your couch or whatever. But I think there's a larger narrative at play here. And that larger narrative really is, um, you know, going back to where uh, interest rates are, if you look at um, the types of returns that uh, a 30-something needs to earn in order to save for retirement, they're not going to get it in fixed income. I mean, uh, you know, one and a half to three percentage kind of returns is not going to get you to where you want to be uh, in 30 years when you retire. So I think you very well could see, um, you know, an entire generation of millennials continue to move into the market and really uh, drive uh, the market going forward. Uh, in order to get that, you know, call it seven to eight percent type of return that they would need um, to, uh, to to build up a nest egg. So I think there is a, a powerful narrative here around the individual investor. It's kind of that Tina narrative, right? There is no alternative. And, and I think understanding that dynamic is an important uh, thing to understand when you think about the factors that are driving uh, markets now and will continue to drive them. Are, are there any parts of the market, uh, Jeff, that look looks like it's in a bubble that we're not actually seeing or we're not focused on? Yeah, I mean, I mean um, there's always uh, parts of a market that are undervalued and parts that are that are overvalued. I, I think, you know, we're a value-oriented firm. And so I think, um, you know, if you look at the, the valuation gap between, uh, I, I guess, what academics would deem to be traditional uh, value stocks versus growth stocks, it's it's pretty dramatic. So I think value sets up well here. But, but that said, I think the whole debate between value and growth is a, a bit asinine because obviously growth is a component of value. So I think the opportunities um, exist both in, we can call them maybe more traditional value situations, kind of mean reverting situations, companies that are trading at, at, at big discounts to their capitalized earning power on the one hand. And then on the other hand, I think there are opportunities in misunderstood growth. I think um, uh, there's a, a, lot of, a, a lot of companies in the 21st century um, are, are wrongly viewed as being super expensive uh, because I think gap accounting doesn't really capture the reinvestment opportunity correctly that these, these companies have. So. Uh, look, I think there are clearly uh, parts of the market that have gone too far, but but both within value and growth, I think you can still find opportunities. But I think 2021 is going to be a stock picker's market. I think you really have to understand what you're buying, where the value lies. And so I, I, I think just a wholesale investment into equities in a passive way will not do nearly as well as, uh, as good old fashioned stock picking. Jeff, I, I know you know, or you say that the biggest long-term risk is, of course, the central bank policy unwinding. Mm -hmm. Is that a story for 2022 or even beyond? I think beyond. I mean, you know, when I when I take a look out at the horizon and I see what what really keeps me up at night, I think what keeps me up at night is at some point uh, all of this monetary uh, stimulus um, and, and the amount of reserves that the central bank has created. Um, really since the great financial crisis. You go all the way back to 0809, and it's just been ramped up even, um, I think the monetary base peaked around 4 trillion, somewhere around 2015, and post-pandemic now it's like over 5 trillion. So that's, that's a crazy amount uh, of reserves uh, relative to history. I mean, I think before 0809, the monetary base was somewhere around 900 you know, billion. So, um, but the breakdown between that base and M2, uh, it really has been quite dramatic. So you haven't seen a, you know, even though they've increased the monetary base, you haven't seen a big increase in the money supply. You haven't seen inflation because for a long period, we've been going through a deleveraging in the private sector. At some point, that's going to change. At some point, they will have to pull out of the system all of the reserves that they put in there or a good chunk of them. And even if you just let it roll off and they try to uh, to do it very, you know, slow and easy, uh, it and able to do that without meaningfully having having a meaningful impact on interest rates, I think is a challenge and will be a challenge uh, over the next, I don't know, five, maybe 10 years. Uh, I don't really know the time frame here, but, but at some point, the unwinding of this will become a challenge. And to be able to do it without, you know, significantly increasing interest rates or having inflation run away with you, that will be the challenge that central bankers face. And if you had a scenario where they lost control of the situation, I think that would be really bad. Uh, for equities, but it would be even worse for fixed income. Um, so, 
that is the uh, the challenge that that I think we are going to face on the other side of all of this, and we'll have to watch really closely to see how that develops. Great, thanks so much, Jeff Henriksen, there, Thorpe Abbott's Capital Chief Executive and University of Oxford Associate Fellow. Now let's get straight to the Bloomberg First Word News in London. With me is Leanne Gerrans. Hi, Leanne. Hi, Francine. Two veteran regulators, strongly backed by progressive Democrats, have been picked to head two key Wall Street watchdogs. The former head of the Commodity Futures Trading Commission, Gary Gensler, will head the SEC. FTC member Rohit Chopla is being named to run the consumer. Financial Protection Bureau. Now, Joe Biden's inauguration speech on Wednesday will have several themes. The incoming president is expected to outline how he'll tackle the health and economic crisis he inherits. At the same time, Biden will call on the U.S. to abandon the decisiveness stoked by President Trump. He's been sworn in two weeks after the riot at Capitol Hill. The White House is planning a farewell for Donald Trump on Wednesday when he leaves Washington for the last Last time as president, Bloomberg News has seen a copy of the invitation. The event will take place at Joint Base Andrews, where the outgoing president will make his departure on Air Force One. It's scheduled for four hours before Joe Biden is sworn in. And there are global gaps in access to coronavirus vaccines. And that's raising concerns that the continued spread of the disease will breed more dangerous versions of the pathogen. The US, Britain and European Union have given citizens about 24 million doses so far. That's more than half of the shots administered globally. Some countries haven't yet started their campaigns. Global News 24 hours a day on air and at Bloomberg Quick Take. Powered by more than 27. 700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Leanne Gerrans. This is Bloomberg Francine. Leanne, thank you so much. Now, coming up next, John Stilidis, geopolitical strategist at Trilogy Advisors and diplomacy consultant to the Department of State under contract. He's coming up shortly, and this is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance. You're looking at the principal room. Coming up today, Dr. Scott Rizmiller from the Atrium Health System. This is Bloomberg. The first thing he, he is clearly doing, which is using language of reconciliation, of reaching out, and it's it's in his nature. I mean, I've known Joe Biden for a long period of time. He's someone who, you know, has genuinely got a good heart, good values. Um, he can see the divisions of America, and he's made it his job as president. This is why he's, in a way, the right man in the right place at the right time, to try and bring the country together. But the second thing, because this is not an American-specific problem, it's all over the world, it's to focus on delivery. And you've got an immediate focus with the pandemic. And the best way to overcome some of the divisions within society is to show that you're delivering for the people, is to show that, first of all, with the pandemic, but then also with the economic recovery, that's going to be extraordinarily difficult. And, and it's a monumental challenge for governments after all the economic destruction of COVID, quite apart from the health aspects. It's going to be really important to show people that you're making progress, that you're delivering. And so that's the best way of bringing people together because, you know, my view, the biggest challenge democracy faces today in the Western world is efficacy. It's getting things done. What do you think is the most pressing action that still needs to be taken at this point by the UK government? Well, I think, to be fair, that they're, they're, they're really ramping up vaccination, and that is, that's good. Um, you know, that's a, a real positive thing that's happened in these last couple of weeks. And, you know, as the supply comes through, we need to go faster and further. And the only thing the UK government's got to make sure is one, that as soon as the supply is there, it's out of the door and into people's arms, as it were. Um, and that's just a, a matter of logistics. But to be fair, as I say, I think they are ramping up considerably at the moment. 
Well, that was the former UK Prime Minister, uh, Tony Blair. Now let's get to, straight to Joan, John uh, Stilidis, rather, geopolitical strategist at Trilogy Advisors, who joins us now to talk about uh, what the new Biden administration can actually usher in. Uh, John, thank you for joining us. I think the first question is, how is Joe Biden going to you know, deal with Russia, given also uh, the audacity with which Vladimir Putin dealt with Mr. Navalny? It's going to be a very important question in shaping the geopolitical agenda of the Biden administration, Francine, and thank you again for having me. Uh, we're not really sure yet how they're going to begin the U.S.-Russia relationship, uh, but Vladimir Putin has sent a very important message that he feels that he can act with relative impunity, undaunted, in his treatment of uh, domestic dissidents and uh, opposition leaders such as Mr. Navalny. I think also he believes that he has the Europeans on his side because the Trump administration was unsuccessful in trying to stop the Nord Stream 2 pipeline that doubles Germany's dependence on Russia for energy supplies. And also there's a question inside of NATO as to whether or not the Trump style of diplomacy kind of beating uh, some of our allies with a two by four to get them to ramp up their defense spending to over 2 percent has led to a raw relationship that has made the NATO cohesiveness a little bit more of a challenge than one would have wanted. And so NATO may be somewhat weaker in its cohesiveness in dealing with Russia. Joe Biden has looked to make that a priority of repairing that, that alliance relationship. And also the question of Vladimir Putin, both directly with the Biden administration, looking at the U.S. in a very antagonistic manner right now. He's very much concerned about the team of advisors led by Victoria Nuland that Joe Biden is bringing in that bring a very anti-Russian bias to U.S. foreign policy. And also the yeah. fact that Vladimir Putin has been increasingly cozying up to General Secretary Xi Jinping of China and looking to see where maybe there won't be a strategic alliance between China and Russia, but there is definitely a very strong and pronounced tactical uh, partnership right now looking to take advantage of what they see as American weakness in Europe, in the Middle East, and in Southeast Asia. But, John, how much does, you know, President Biden, once he becomes president on Wednesday, focus on foreign policy if he still has a large percentage of the population not believing he won the U.S. election um, fairly? It's going to be a great challenge for President Biden. Uh, as you correctly note, Francine, uh, most polls taken over the last 10 days after the January 6th mob events on the U.S. Capitol show that still about 90 percent of American Republicans would vote for Donald Trump if the election were held today. And about 80 percent of Republicans do not believe that Joe Biden won the presidential election in a fair and legal manner. So there's going to be a very important reconciliation process. I think that's going to be very important. I think vice, uh, well, former vice president, now president-elect Joe Biden, is sending very strong signals that he was elected to heal the nation, to unify the nation. Some of the rhetoric in the last few weeks has been a little bit more divisive, I think, than one would expect if that's the true objective. But his centrist instincts, I think, can serve the Democratic Party well if there is an effort to actually bring the parties together and solve the problems that are most important for the American people. But if Joe Biden is overtly influenced by the more sort of socialist wing, uh, more radical left that is looking to punish Republicans and to act with vengeance against them, especially against uh, not only Trump supporters, say, who were at the rally, but 75 million Americans who would be subject to second-class citizenship if some of these more radical types had their way, well, that's not just polarization. That puts us in a very, very bad direction, both for the country and for American leadership around the world. So, so what should his top three priorities be in the coming, in the first 100 days? I think it's very important to see where there are ways that Democrats and Republicans can work together. I don't know about the, the stimulus package and whether there are certain aspects of it that are going to be very problematic for the Republicans. Of course, the Republican Party, as everyone knows, is a party that prefers smaller government, lower taxes, less regulation. But Joe Biden is going to have to satisfy some of the more radical elements in the Democratic Party with, say, the bailout of state pension funds and also moving towards a number of climate-related regulations. So that's understandable. But the degree to which Joe Biden is able to bring Republicans to the table and say, look, we're all one country here. Let's find ways on the issues that we can perhaps compromise on to do good things for the economy, to lift up, as uh, former Prime Minister Tony Blair just said now, to try to deal with the economic destruction 
of many of these misguided lockdown policies resulting from the COVID pandemic. So I think that outreach is going to be very important. And then on the Republican side, Francine, the question is, how do they respond? Because about 35 to 40 percent of Republicans are what I would call hardcore Trump supporters that may want no reconciliation, no unification, if it means with Joe Biden. They want a Trump presidency again. That's going to be a very difficult part of the base to placate. But about 60 percent of Republicans who are more traditional may be seeking ways to work with uh, Democrats. And I think yeah. we'll have a better snapshot of this, Francine, come 2022. Those will be the congressional mm -hmm. elections, of course. And traditionally, the party out of power in the White House tends to do better. So that bodes well for the Republican Party. Yeah. But depends on what Donald Trump does over the next two years, what the Republican leadership in the John. Senate and the House do over the next two years, how Democrats treat Republicans, and, of course, how world events shape American politics. John, thank you so much. John Stilidis there, Trilogy Advisors, geopolitical strategist. Now, coming up, we speak to Johns Hopkins' Joshua Sharstein to look at the vaccines. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London. Now, we did have some worrying news about the vaccine and possible allergies in certain cases. So let's get an important update with Joshua Sharfstein of Johns Hopkins University. Uh, Joshua, I have a, a lot of questions on the vaccines, but of course, the, the one that's worrying the most is uh, Norway saying that a number had allergic reactions to these vaccines. Is this normal in this point in time? Well, we certainly know that there are allergic reactions to the vaccine in the United States. There have been about 10 million doses delivered, and the rate of a serious allergic reaction appears to be pretty low, maybe one in 100,000 or something like that. So, um, you know, it's a possibility, but the risk of getting COVID and getting sick from COVID is far higher than that, and allergic reactions are treatable. So, so far, it has not been a deterrent to a big vaccination campaign. Are, are there other serious reactions? I know there have been a number of, you know, very few, but but still deaths. Are, is there anything in, in that the vaccine manufacturers are now saying that they could change? Or again, is it, you know, something that unfortunately, as awful as it is, it, it happens? Well, there's nothing that I know of that's actually linked to the vaccine. There are things that happen to people after vaccination, just because there's so many people getting vaccinated. You're going to see things happen after the vaccination. And there are studies that are done, and um, I'm sure will be done if there are any signals that pop up to see whether or not, you know, something that happens is just a coincidence or whether it's really related to the vaccine. This is standard for any large vaccination program. Um, but at this point, uh, I'm not aware of anything that would, uh, you know, it's so concerning that people are, are thinking about making changes, fundamental changes to the vaccination program. Um, Dr. Sharstein, is, is, you know, do we have data to know how much it reduces once you get the vaccine? How much is reduces the chance of giving COVID if you catch it to someone else? You know, there's some signs of that data, right? So, so you're pointing the studies that were the basis of approval showed 95% reduction in getting sick. But in terms of what's your chance of passing it on, um, there'll be more uh, extensive studies, but it looks like um, there is definitely some benefit, maybe, you know, in the ballpark of half, two thirds, something like that. Yeah. Thank you so much. Joshua Sharfstein there, Johns Hopkins.